going to talk a little bit about monitoring and feedback loops. You heard that come up a lot in the morning. My name is Jonah Cowell. I'm a VP at uh, App Dynamics. Prior to joining App Dynamics just a few months ago, uh, I led the Gartner Research Area in Availability and Performance Monitoring. So anything having to do with monitoring is what I specialize in. Prior to that, I was an end user running IT operations and security at various startups and larger companies. Had a couple acquisitions, so uh, that's my background. And pleased to keep it interactive. I don't necessarily want to stand up here and just talk, but I know uh, based on the way the other talks have gone, <laughs> Not a lot of audience interaction, but that's fine. Uh, so we're going to start off just actually framing some interesting things that have happened in the industry driven by software before we get into feedback loops specifically. So when you look at these new companies that are disrupting massive industries, they're doing so with a real software innovation focus. And this has caused all of the existing companies that are well established to rethink their approaches. So these are all examples. Uber doesn't actually own any cars, but they're the biggest transportation company for, for cars. Airbnb doesn't actually own any properties, yet they do a massive amount of commerce, renting out properties and competing with the hotel industry. So these are all kind of examples that uh, make you really sit back and wonder whether and how many other industries are going to be disrupted that are kind of just well established. Now what started to happen is People in IT operations, we used to focus here much more, and we tried to keep these things up and running the back office systems. But the business is now pushing us and reallocating all their resources to these new innovative type of uh, projects and such. Things like new web applications, mobile devices, wearable applications that are changing the industry pretty significantly. And this is really what's driving the future growth of business in general. And so let's take a step back and, and now that we understand what's fundamentally changing in these companies, why monitoring is so broken and not meeting the demands of these new digital businesses in general. So what happened is in these conventional enterprises, the stuff that everyone was dealing with five or ten years ago, we had pretty conventional patterns in our applications. And the systems that we used to collect data looked similar to these. They tended, they tended, they had the same type of uh, designs, generally speaking. And when you look at the new designs, the things that people are going to, it's not necessarily saying that these are going away, but any of these new innovative types of things happening in business are typically built on this pattern. Many times they're on public cloud, and you're sort of seeing a mixture of the stuff that used to exist and the stuff that's being built. And so this creates a lot of challenges for people in operations because you have to be comfortable with this. We just heard a talk on Oracle, and yet you have to also realize that this is where the growth is happening, like SoundCloud's architecture. Looks much more like this than like this. So this is creating major problems because you have to balance both of these types of patterns and increasingly, you have to start looking at lots of different languages starting to come into your environments. And when I was talking to Victor, he was saying they have every language and framework and technology under the sun, and they don't require their developers to stick to just one or two application uh, types in general. You'll still have a core, so a lot of the stuff is still in Java, but on top of it, you're running Scala and other kinds of frameworks and technologies, JRuby to run Ruby on top of Java. Those are all examples of that. And now that .NET is open sourced, who knows what's going to happen with that. It could turn into a much more, let's say, open and uh, interoperable set of technologies. So this causes a lot of complications for both developers and operations because you have to feel comfortable working in all these languages different JVMs, different technologies that are all uh, being kind of mashed together to create these applications. So let's kind of talk about feedback loops. So uh, briefly this morning, we saw the three ways of DevOps, and we didn't really dig into it so much, but feedback loops are a critical element of DevOps. So looking at a really basic feedback loop before we actually get into DevOps 
the idea is that uh, I have an idea or something that I want to change or correct. I'm going to measure it, analyze the measurements, make another change, <coughs> and basically iterate through this cycle. If you try to make a change, and a lot of times I, when I was at Gartner and I spoke to thousands of users of monitoring tools, they would say, oh, we're moving our data center and then we're going to change our monitoring tools after that. The issue is if you don't measure properly before you make changes, you can't actually understand whether your changes had a positive or a negative impact, and you're going to be asked to explain whether you had a positive or negative impact and how it looks. So it's always important to measure before you actually start making any changes. So the loop actually really starts at, at measure and then iterates through here. So a good example of a feedback loop is in the bathroom. <laughs> you, there, there are actually restrooms where you can actually give feedback uh, as to how good your bathroom experience was. Uh, so this is an example of a feedback loop if they decide to clean the bathroom more often or change some type of, uh, let's say, the soap or put lotion in there or however to make it nicer, they can measure and get feedback from users. So direct feedback is one mechanism, but you can also measure uh, users, user experience, and, and mixing those two feedback mechanisms together is what really provides you the best understanding of the level of service that you're providing and also whether your changes are effective. So when we start to talk about DevOps, then we obviously have a few different elements entered into the feedback loop here. Typically, you will think of an idea, or someone will think of an idea, an incremental change. You'll develop that uh, incremental change, test it, deploy it, monitor it, which is essentially collecting data, and then you'll analyze that data. So this is the kind of the typical loop that you see out there. Obviously, as much of this as you can automate. Uh, unfortunately, the analysis tends to be way less automated than the rest of the pieces in this feedback loop. But with technologies like machine learning, the analysis will get better and better, and we'll be able to actually embed algorithms into the feedback loop to understand the effectiveness of the things that we've developed and deployed into our environment. So I think we're still a few years off from that becoming a reality, but that's generally the direction that a lot of monitoring is going now that the data collection is becoming significantly more advanced than it was just a few years ago. And we'll talk about that a little bit as well. So a lot of people kind of have a religious war when it comes to data collection and monitoring. They either think that pushing data or pulling data, meaning collecting data, is the right way to do something. And the answer is that you always need to use both and that they both scale. So the idea of checking a service or the idea of getting data from something that's running and collecting information, these are both standard ways of monitoring. And people that say you can only push because it scales or you can only get because then you can control don't really understand the different reasons why you want push or pull in general. Both of them have different scalability issues and they have kind of pros and cons, but it's best to use a combination of both systems to gather data from whatever you're monitoring, whether it be applications or infrastructure uh, or services as well. So some of the ideas in, in terms of requesting and collecting data, you can either request data based on a standard protocol. Uh, these are examples of some of the common monitoring protocols when people check services. Uh, or you can use an API that's exposed, um, you know, whether it be something that's more abstractive like SNMP, WMI, or other types of protocols, or a web service uh, running over HTTP. The other way to observe what's happening in a system, and this is more of a push, is either to leverage network to kind of uh, get data coming from the network, whether it be packets or flow data, or you can actually instrument the application. This is like what APM products do, like AppDynamics. Uh, we actually go in and figure out what's happening in the application and send data. They typically require a lightweight agent or you can do it 
uh, from the device itself if there's a network uh, capture element to it. Most of the APM tools tend to use agent versus network data today, but I think in the next year you'll probably see many more APM products having both options. And then the network data itself can also be gathered from a central location without having anything on your infrastructure. The reason why people tend to move away from the network areas because as we start to adopt more levels of abstraction, whether it's virtualization, public cloud, or things like containers, this technology becomes very difficult, if not impossible, to use and scale. So you're typically seeing more software-based approaches to monitoring uh, in terms of the observation piece. So a couple of the different ways that this can be done, and both are effective. If you have a, gr a good development team and your team is aligned in terms of how they log data, how they write data, you can write your own code instrumentation and send that either to log files or to metric stores. And I'll give some examples of some of the open source technologies in that area. And if you're dealing with packaged applications or you have very complex applications run by teams that maybe don't talk to each other as well, specifically, APM tools can give you all the instrumentation and visibility. This is a screenshot from App Dynamics, but uh, you know, there are other products as well. The thing that you get here that makes it easier is being able to trace and stitch transactions from the user device all the way through the infrastructure components. So as people start to decompose their services into microservices, which is something I actually expected other people to talk about more uh, during the day here, but the reason why, uh, I guess a little like side note on that, the reason why people are so interested in Docker and how you move that to production is because you typically have big monolithic applications that developers are slowly deconstructing into smaller services. So what that means is a typical page request, like Victor showed that with his Chrome browser debug and his talk. The typical single request is now fanning out into dozens, if not uh, hundreds, of requests that are happening on the back end. There's some interesting statistics about uh, when you look at Amazon, <coughs> uh, sorry, Netflix, 99.8% of their API calls are internal to the way that their application works not external the way that APIs used to be consumed just five years ago or so. So what that's causing is the understanding of what is touching what and what's dependent on what and the path of a transaction is becoming very difficult to understand from an operations perspective and that's really why everyone is so much more interested in application performance tools because of all the complexity being introduced to their applications. So people seem to think that uh, overhead is introduced by products that you put into your environment. So for example, in APM, people are uh, very concerned with how much overhead it introduces to go in and pull this data out of your running application. And they think that writing logs in your code doesn't have any overhead, which it definitely does. Uh, so you really have to test and understand how much overhead uh, is actually being introduced by whatever type of monitoring or logging that you do. Um, because you'd be surprised how much even simple logging can actually impact the user experience and the performance of your application. The same thing can be said when you're testing your application synthetically, like when you're pulling it, for example. The data that uh, the polling itself can actually generate load on your application and affect the user experience. So people that over monitor synthetically by going and hitting their application too regularly or in too much depth uh, can impact the performance. So some of the ways that you can measure end user experience if you're an open source shop, uh, Boomerang is a very common uh, end user experience JavaScript based tool that will actually uh, pull data directly from the browser and you can feed that into various metric stores like Graphite, for example, if you're, if you're an open source shop. Or you can use commercial tools that will do the same type of thing but 
deeper than Boomerang and make it so that you don't have to piece together so many moving parts. And I'll talk about some of the kind of open source and other kind of monitoring tools out there. But monitoring itself definitely has uh, overhead and definitely can cause issues when you start measuring the impact it has on the user. So when you're monitoring your end user, you have to, <coughs> the focus has to be on monitoring the end user. Typically most people that go out there and look for APM uh, are specifically looking to get a better understanding of their users. And that user experience and whether they're satisfied or not and how they're using your application are typically the first things that people get when they implement end user experience monitoring. Uh, and, and understanding those users is the first step of actually starting to understand how your application path and flow is actually put together. So when you're collecting all this data, whether it be from the user or the different components in the application, you have a major issue of data overload in general. And the question is, how do you alert? So how do you determine when something is unhealthy? The challenge is you can either do things with anomaly detection, uh, you can try to use a threshold, which is the most common thing that people use, but most people find that they're overwhelmed by alerts in general. And most of the technology out there isn't where it needs to be in terms of understanding normality or when things are behaving poorly. So with machine learning, there are better kind of technology starting to come into place, new algorithms and kind of that really <coughs> basic depiction of how machine learning works in the corner over there. Uh, but by and large today, uh, when you see the word analytics, it mostly means reporting and doesn't really mean the computer doing the human's work, which is what analytics is supposed to mean. And I think that we'll get there in the next couple of years where analytics will slowly start to change from user-driven querying of data from the computer actually telling you the insights that it's finding in the data. Um, but we're still a little ways off. I think you'll start to see some of that in the next year or two, I would say. We clearly have enough data. It's just about making sense of the data. And right now, unfortunately, everyone has a million dashboards with tons of data, and they try to figure out how to make sense of all that data. Uh, those are definitely some of the challenges that probably get worse with open source tools, because you actually need so many different monitoring tools to, to cover all your bases. So the reason why you shouldn't actually store rates of data, and you'll find a lot of monitoring tools will summarize data too much and essentially make it so that you can't understand the meaning. So this is a picture that is stored without compression or without uh, actually normalizing the data. On the right, when you start compressing it, you start losing the features of the actual data that you collect, and there's no way to get that back. So if you decide that uh, you need to analyze a metric that you've summarized, once you've summarized that data, you can't get it back to the fidelity that you need to do the analysis. So it's important to store the raw data and not to store averages or, rate, or rates in general. Um, and this is kind of the illustration of why you don't do that with, with the photograph, for example. So this information overload uh, was definitely touched on earlier. This is kind of the typical knock even, and this is all like open source based stuff. There's too, too much data, too many screens, too many dashboards, people don't know what they mean, inundated with email alerts or other kinds of tickets. The typical advice is to focus on early warning indicators by changes in end user experience because if I know my application delivery is having issues, then there's somewhere behind the user that's the cause of the issue. So if you use end user experience as an early warning indicator, that can avoid you getting alerts based on the entire path of the monitoring, uh, which is typically what happens today. When you look at open source, uh, you tend to need several tools. These are examples of kind of common stacks. So you'll see Anagios or Zabbix, 
if you're on open source. You'll see StatsD, CollectD, you'll see an ELK stack for doing log analysis. These are kind of common patterns. Graphite will be the back end for StatsD and CollectD. And so you end up having all these tools collecting data, visualizing it. They don't know about each other. So when you have an alert coming from one of these tools, the other tool has no idea where that data is coming from. This is why monitoring is not very good, why monitoring actually sucks. And the reason why, uh, sorry, a little digression, the reason why I came to App Dynamics is because we're actually trying to solve this problem, which is the fact that the tools all don't have context between each other. So our idea of the way that we want to do monitoring is application and user centric, and then the infrastructure related down to the user and the application. If we can accomplish that, which is probably one to two years off, because right now we're focused much more on the application layer, I think we can solve a lot of these issues that end up happening when you have a million screens and dashboards and data that doesn't relate to each other. So, um, so the uh, you know the fact that these different feedbacks or chains are related to each other, especially as you start to implement DevOps, definitely. Uh, requires a tighter linkage between monitoring and the other components. The common pattern that you still see is that monitoring comes after the fact. So when code is handed off or moved into production environments, then monitoring is implemented versus it being implemented earlier in the development cycle or even in uh, the testing phase. I think we're still a ways off from that becoming the norm, even though we know that it needs to happen. Um, I think in, in many ways the monitoring uh, isn't introduced early enough in the process, <laughs> and I'm not really sure the best way to solve that problem, because it tends to be like a cultural issue in most cases, that's what I find. Um, having the developer responsible for writing some of the monitoring, or at least the specs for monitoring, can help with that implementation, but it's still definitely a challenge because the development team typically doesn't understand infrastructure, and the infrastructure-focused teams don't typically understand the software all that well. So it's still definitely an issue, and building smaller teams that work together can help bridge it, but it's still definitely a problem. So if you decide to do it yourself, and this, for example, is kind of a typical graphite stack, uh, you can think of these as the inputs, this is the database, and these as visualizations. Uh, people tend to like different visualizers for their monitoring data. The issue is that you have to integrate all of this together and it can become a challenge. And this is just on kind of the application layer. Then you still need to introduce infrastructure <laughs> monitoring and network monitoring. So it's, uh, it's still a challenge for sure. Uh, but if you want a highly customized solution that you can develop on your own and can log essentially any type of metric you want, uh, you know, this is one way to go about doing that. There are commercial tools that are similar, both that are offered SaaS uh, or on-premises as well. Um, but these are really generic metric collection systems instead of being more robust monitoring tools out there. So, you know, I explained some of the issues of why monitoring is, uh, is component-based and uh, challenging, to say the least. The other piece that now you're starting to see some of the more innovative people in monitoring start to look at, uh, Adrian Cocroft, one of the original guys from Netflix that ran infrastructure, he actually just started to build some open source tools around topology. And the understanding of topology is becoming more important in open source than it has been. At App Dynamics, topology has always been our key. Uh, the first thing that you see when you implement our product is you see an actual physical flow diagram of the topology of the application. So the fact that in open source there's no topology causes a big problem because you can't understand how things relate to each other in an application that's constantly changing. So topology is definitely key, and transactional visibility is key. Can I look at that single transaction from the user uh, 
look at the paths of the transactions so that I can understand where the issues are occurring in my environment. And then once you start getting into the end user experience that I touched on, understanding the browser, browser performance, uh, network latency, DNS performance, that kind of thing. Um, and then you just have too many events that come into the system. So I mean, these are kind of the reason why open source has fallen behind, but free works, so people will implement it even if it doesn't give you the benefits that you need. Um, so people always ask, what should I monitor? Should I monitor metrics from my systems themselves? These are some examples. Should I monitor capacity utilization throughput? So the answer is somewhat, uh, I sort of like guided you down the wrong path. So throughput is a rate, so you should never measure rates. That's definitely one of the tenants here. Um, if you're a company that's selling hosting, and I bet some of you guys sell hosting, you should definitely monitor those things. But if your business is selling uh, whatever it may be selling, if you're selling music streaming or you're selling uh, or you're or running a banking system, you shouldn't be measuring these metrics as your primary focus of monitoring. You have to figure out how to up-level the conversation and start to measure things in a business context. So instead of thinking as metrics in the technical sense, think about them in the business sense. So if you're a retail bank, uh, for example, you, you shouldn't just monitor your infrastructure and your applications. You should monitor if your customers are actually able to do what your business is supposed to do. So moving it to the user experience and measuring a business transaction is always the best path uh, versus trying to go into kind of infrastructure monitoring. We've spent a lot of time on the infrastructure side in the past, and, and now it's time to start thinking about the user experience, the business context of the transactions that are being run. So uh, you should also monitor each transaction versus monitoring like a rate of transactional flow. Like I said, try to stay away from rates because you can calculate a rate if you have all the metrics. So you should do that on the fly versus storing a rate always. Uh, because then if you store rates, you can't ever get back to the data that you started with. Similar to the picture, if you store the picture that's been compressed, you can never get back the original data that the picture had when you took it. So this is a little plug for app dynamics I threw in here. So some of the, the things that we're trying to do is we're trying to not only capture the business context of the transactions, but also everything that happens along the way. So that includes all the code that's executing, the logs that are generated, information about the infrastructure, but putting it into context of a business transaction. And we do this without code changes. The other option, of course, is to have your developers <coughs> code a lot of custom metrics and data, which you can do if your developers are all on the same page and you're logging consistently. Um, but we provide this for applications where you own the code and applications where you don't own the code, as long as it's in languages that we support. So uh, the other piece uh, that we do that's somewhat interesting is because we're collecting all this data, we put it into a big data metric store that allows you to slice and dice and visualize and search uh, any way you want. So you can build kind of custom SLA views, you can do things like, uh, you know, querying logs or other transaction, transactional data. The, the other thing is that each of the languages that we support, it's all kind of interdependent on the agent technology that we sell. So if you're using Java, .NET, PHP, Node, Python, uh, and soon, soon Ruby, um, you know, we'll support those technologies. And we'll also support the operational database side. So it, the other piece uh, that, that we provide that's interesting is we also collect metrics from cloud services out there, Amazon, Azure, and several others. And we also provide deployment flexibility. So you can put it in your data center. We can host it for you as a SaaS service as well. So we provide kind of a comprehensive view of this. And you can also build it on your own uh, you know, with the open source technologies out there. <clears throat> 
So this is a, a great quote from, uh, from John Rouser at Amazon about looking at your customer data and the transactions that are happening. If you don't understand what your customers are doing, then uh, you don't really understand how your business is actually working. So it's important to think about monitoring at a higher level instead of at the infrastructure where we've been focused on kind of in the past. Um, I'll take any questions, comments. I'm probably not going to get any, but I'll try. Oh, we have one. Cool. Sure. Yeah, so when you look at tools in the past, they typically used to run some type of discovery that would go out there and see what's happening. That doesn't really scale in most environments because today with public and private cloud, you're always provisioning and deprovisioning workloads. So because we use an agent, the agent starts pushing data as soon as the workload comes online. So you would package our agent into your VM or your Docker container or however you're deploying. The agent starts pushing. When you decide to recycle that, take it offline, the agent goes away. So it enables you to scale it and control it in a distributed manner versus going out and discovering. Um, also, the topology is discovered real time based on transaction flow. So as soon as traffic starts going through a system and transactions are executing, data is automatically displayed and the topology is, is, is viewable. Yeah, so in, in the analytics tools that we have and also other APM products have, there are APIs to put custom metrics in, but you don't really need to do that because we can actually extract anything from running code. There's only two APM products today that can extract data from running code. So for example, if you know a method, let's say it's a checkout method that's in your Java code, we can actually extract the result of that Java code on the fly and store that as a metric. So it makes it so that your developers don't have to go and custom code. We can extract anything from the payload. Same with the HTTP client. So if you want to pull off something from a URL or cookie, we can automatically turn that into what we call a business transaction. And that can be a metric that you <coughs> want to track or monitor. So even though we monitor things like CPU and all the other kind of metrics around code execution, we also monitor uh, your business transactions the same way. So let's say you, you think about a fluctuation in response time or CPU as an issue, but a fluctuation in your checkouts, if you're an e-commerce site, that should be a very critical business issue. So we monitor those metrics the same way that we monitor application or infrastructure metrics. And it makes it uh, very flexible in terms of how you actually extract custom metrics from running code. So it's not really that hard to do. Um, and it's something that definitely differentiates APM products from writing your own custom instrumentation, which you could do too if you want to do it that way. Um, any other questions, comments? Sure. <laughs> So I don't like to plug our competitors, but uh, Dynatrace is the only other one on the market that can extract that way. The difference is that we have an analytics store on the back end that enables you to visualize and track them differently. Whereas with Dynatrace, you don't have that type of capability unless you go with a partner solution. And then you kind of end up having two views that look different. and. So it kind of in reintroduces the monitoring problem with all the screens as you start adding tools. Most people have at least 15 monitoring tools on average. The worst I've seen is about 85 monitoring tools. And uh, Victor, you mentioned, right? How many do you guys have? 20? I want to say 20. So they're a, star a startup with uh, you know, less than 200 people, and they have 20 monitoring tools. So you can think about an enterprise with 10,000 people, 20,000 people, that's when you start going <coughs> into the dozens and dozens of monitoring tools out there. So, any other uh, questions? Yeah, one more. Uh, can, you, can you explain how the end user monitor engagement? Sure, yeah. So let's say you're a Java 
uh, shop and you put our Java agent on your Tomcat container, WebSphere, whatever it may be. When the data comes back from uh, the app server, we inject a piece of JavaScript into the uh, response, which the client then executes. So as the JavaScript's executing on the browser, it sends back timing data about how long it takes for it to render a page, uh, how long it takes for the data to load, DNS requests. There's actually a lot of standards and browsers for pulling that. Uh, that are all W3C and supported in today's modern browsers. So that's how we collect data, and it's a standard way. So I mentioned the open source project Boomerang. They use those same type of APIs on the browser to pull that raw data, uh, where you can get information <laughs> about timing and performance of the client side. Uh, but that, that's always evolving. There's new specs coming out and new standards, so we're always implementing new things to get better visibility into the client, so. Sure. So, uh, so there's two pieces of monitoring. There's availability and performance. Uh, synthetics are important for availability, so to make sure things are up and running. The problem is that people over-monitor synthetically, so they end up almost load testing their own systems because they're exercising too many different components. So it's important to do lightweight monitoring to make sure that the service will work when a user comes. But it's not important to go so deep synthetically that you're spending a lot of time maintaining scripts that can be very burdensome and cause issues when you're trying to scale your teams. Uh, to give you an example, when I ran enterprise monitoring and management at Thomson Reuters globally, we had about 7,000 synthetic tests which were custom scripted and I had a team of nine people just to maintain and manage those. Someone drops new code, you gotta recode all of those synthetic scripts and you gotta update them all. That's incredibly intensive and doesn't really provide the value as doing a lightweight kind of availability monitor. So we have a synthetic product uh, at AppDynamics in beta. Uh, it's launching in about uh, six weeks or so out of beta. Uh, that provides the same user interface and everything like that. So it's, synthetic is important, but it shouldn't be a focus anymore. Any other monitoring questions? Guess I'm good. Well, thanks for your time. Thanks for having me.